Strikers, a 1983 post-apocalyptic action film from director Sirio Santiago. I never want to run out of these. The movie opens like most of these movies do, with a nuke and a voiceover explaining the backstory. The nuclear holocaust wiped out all semblance of rhyme and reason. World War III was a mistake, and the world's been turned into a big desert. The survivors are all fighting over the most precious resource. What's it this time? For water is power. Ah, water. That takes me back to Exterminators of the Year 3000. And whoever controls the water controls the world. Okay, now tell me about the spice. It wouldn't be a post-apocalyptic film without at least one Playboy Playmate. So, here's some of that desert I was talking about. We return to Totally Not the Road Warrior, already in progress. A woman's being chased through the wasteland by a bunch of ruffians in silly face masks. They run our hero, Stryker, off the road. He certainly looks like a mix of the Marlboro Man and Crocodile Dundee. Not quite like he does in the poster. Here he looks more like, uh, the Heat Miser. Dalla decides instead of trying to outrun these guys on her bike, she's gonna run into the desert where it's easier to catch her. I hope the guy sitting on the hood of the car got hazard pay. She tries to get her weapons, but the guys catch her and find her supply of water. Just then, Stryker and another guy show up to save the day. They shoot the bad guys and blow a hole in this paper mache head. The lead bad guy gets away in this kinda look-alike prototype Batmobile. Dalla tries to get away, but is caught by Captain Copperfield. Yippee! Stryker shoots the guy. So they saved her life, and what does she do? She steals Stryker's car and smashes into the other guy's bike. The two are walking through the desert, and the soundtrack guy gives up. They stumble into a herd of Jawas. Stryker decides to be nice and share some of his water. Dalla eventually runs out of gas, so she has to walk. Of course, she somehow immediately gets discovered by the guys that were chasing her a few minutes ago. Meanwhile, huh? How did everyone find her so quickly? The guys are outnumbered, so they wait. The bad guys leave, so Stryker goes to get his car back. Hey! She left the car on the road, but now it's here? You're fired, continuity editor. Also, didn't she run out of gas? Oh, he has another tank. Kinda cool they actually addressed this. The guys head back to Matt Painting City, which is led by the evil, kind of looks like Ming the Merciless. They bring Dal in and send her to the dungeon. They tell Cardus they were ambushed by Stryker and he has a flashback. Seems Stryker chopped off his hand back in 1982. So Stryker didn't want to take on one car because it was dangerous, but decides to attack an entire convoy. He starts by blowing up a go-kart. They shoot the jeep, and I wonder if this was planned or just a lucky accident. With the cars out of the way, they move in on the truck. These guards aren't good at their jobs. Cardus finds out they're running out of water. This guy certainly has an impressive gut. The bad guys are beating up Dala, trying to find out where she got her water. She's not giving him any answers, so... Oh, no. Stryker is driving the truck to the evil guy's camp. They dump the truck, and it's full of water, which serves as a great distraction. The guys sneak into the fortress. This is a bold move. They take out a bunch of henchmen and go looking for Dala. They rescue her and Stryker's having a flashback of his own. Seems Cardus beheaded his girlfriend. They kill the henchmen and escape. I hope they can find her some pants. They steal a jeep and blow some stuff up on the way out. The next day, Stryker goes to Troon's camp. Did they purposefully give this guy the worst dubbed voice? Hey, who's your friend? Okay, even the movie doesn't know how to say this guy's name. Troon's camp. They got Troon! He's Troon's brother. Over at Bad Guy Outpost, they have Troon and the Jawas. Stryker and the gang are on the attack. The guy with no name throws his sword to the right, and it somehow curves to the left. They kill the bad guys and save the Jawas. What am I supposed to call them? They don't speak, and none of them are given names. They dig up Troon and take him back to the camp. While they're escaping, some warrior maidens help them out. Ah, the days before digital wire removal. They shoot these arrows about as well as joy. I guess the t-shirt and leather diaper is the uniform of the battle maiden. This girl gets whiplash. The other bad guys arrive to find out Stryker attacked them. Uh-oh, they have a tank. Dalla meets with Troon. She's there to take him to see her father. Ah, Pete and I had an agreement. The first to find the spring would make sure the other knew. There always seems to be this magical fountain in these movies. Troon's talking to Stryker. He left the camp three years ago for no reason. Everybody's got their own highway to hell. Oh, he left to go see ACDC in concert. 
The Battle Maidens sneak into Truin's camp to kidnap Dala. Okay, Dala wasn't supposed to tell them where they had their endless supply of water. They must also have an endless supply of hair product. While taking her back to the base, they get discovered by the bad guys. Wow, in this giant desolate place, these people sure have an easy time finding each other. The tank shoots at them. Not sure what it's shooting, though. Some of the girls got killed in the blast. The girls followed Dalla's tactic to try to escape on foot. Let's hope they have better success. Two escape on foot, and the other two lead the tank away. The head maiden knocks this guy over, making him spit out a mouthful of ketchup. The girls are out running the tank, and oh no, not again! Good thing Troon's men are there to kill the bad guys. Why does he do this? No one is in there. You could have had a tank. Dalla tells them the maidens were trying to keep her from telling them where the water is. The other girls go back to the colony to tell their leader what happened. Okay, now the movie doesn't know how to say her name either. Have you seen Diella? Diella? Okay, fine. Diella. Those shorts are probably chafing something fierce. Girl with no name seems to have taken a liking to guy with no name. Don't you ever feel anything inside? I mean, something that you just feel like saying to get it out of your system. A hot dog is not a sandwich. Oh, you're right, I do feel better. Troon meets with the leader to compare beards. They go to see the spring and pass by the garden. Hey, yeah! This just hit me. Without water in the world, nothing can grow. What are the other people eating? Did they discover an abandoned spam factory? The girls don't like Troon being there. Stryker decides he wants to leave because he thinks Troon's going to become evil. Back to the love story between the two characters with no names. Ooh, the seductive removes the quiver of arrows move. Oh, the triple cut kiss. This is serious. They usually save that for a big explosion. There's a lot of clouds out tonight. Truon's guy Basil betrays him and takes Cardus to the water. Stryker goes to leave, but Diella tries to get him to stay. What in tarnation? Oh, this is kind of nice. Doesn't work, though. Still leaves. Guy with no name finally got lucky, so he's got a lot more spring in his step. He tries to get Stryker to stay by staring blankly at him. While leaving, he notices all the guards are gone and gets captured. They drag him back to Cardus. Crazy gut guy is still alive. I guess his stomach can deflect knives. With Stryker out of the way, they attack the colony. The Jawas then rescue Stryker. They use the water to revive him. Look, I'm sure water would help in this instance, but he's going to need medical attention after being dragged several miles. Cardus attacks. Why are so many people just hanging out in front of the gate? Oh wait, is this supposed to be inside the colony? How are they shooting at the walls and yet hitting them inside? The Jawas arrive with Stryker to help fight off Cardus. They take down the giant. He doesn't seem to mind. Cardus gets inside the colony. He then calls the tanks. Thunder 1. Thunder 2. Thunder 3. Thundercats! Ha! Shouldn't he have done that before he got inside just so they wouldn't blow him up? Doesn't matter though, they're all dead. This guy gets hit with a paper mache rock. Stryker shoots a bunch of Cardus' men in the back. Stryker and Cardus square off. Oh, if only I killed you when I had the chance! Basil gets his comeuppance. We finally get this guy's name! Bandit! I'll never forget you, oh, what's her name? Stryker kills Cardus, and all this violence wakes up a baby. A baby? Whose baby is this? Who knows? Did they mix up the plot and forget it was about the lack of water and not the lack of children? Stryker hears a strange sound, and all the fighting stopped. Finally, after all these years, it's raining. Everyone's overjoyed, even the bad guys are celebrating. Come on, everybody, clean the stink off yourself! Now that it's raining, I guess that means only one thing. This entire movie was pointless. The movie was shot in 30 days on a budget of around $200,000. This movie, like other Santiago productions, was filmed in the Philippines. Santiago's films always had a little something extra that set them apart from the many movies that were being made there at the time. One of the reasons was that he was friends with notable members of the Filipino government. He knew Imelda Marcos, who gave him permission to film in all sorts of off-limit locations, one of which was the fort that was located on Corregidor Island, which was built during World War II. They also were able to get lots of military hardware on loan, like the guns and tanks. It rained constantly in the Philippines. The crew joked about making a film about a future with no water, when they had to stop filming at least once a day because of a downpour. The filming locations were far away from the city, so each day there was a 90 minute to 2 hour drive to and from the shoots. The movies had a bunch of covers over the years, including this one for the VHS, which was taken from the 1982 post-apocalyptic film Battle Truck. 
Battle Truck also had a character named Stracker. This was the first of many Santiago post-apocalyptic films. He loved to start his films off with narration to bring the audience up to speed. In the 80s, Santiago was working with a young Jim Wynorski. He saw his passion for film, and the two became friends. Santiago could see how he wanted to be a director, and let him say action and cut on a scene. Wynorski eventually went off to become a beloved director of cult classic films like The Return of Swamp Thing, The Haunting of Morella, and Chopping Mall. In the late 2000s, Roger Corman was looking through his film catalog and selecting movies to be remade. He picked out Stryker and asked Santiago to remake it as Water Wars. They started filming in the Philippines in 2008. Unfortunately, Santiago was having some health problems at the time, and after filming for a brief period, he told Corman he couldn't continue. Corman called Wynorski and asked him to finish the film. He booked him on a plane that night, and when he arrived, he immediately had to start filming. Only he hadn't had a chance to read the script yet. Thankfully, he had seen Stryker, so he knew what the film was supposed to be. Santiago stayed on the set for a few days before having to leave to go to the hospital. He sadly died shortly thereafter of lung cancer. Wynorski finished Water Wars, but due to various issues with the producers, the film will most likely never receive an official release. Stryker is another great Santiago film, and this one's special to me since it's his first post-apocalyptic film. While his post-apocalyptic films are not the first ones I've seen, they're definitely some of my favorites. Yes, they're silly, but there's a certain charm to them. Plus, his action scenes are second to none. Say what you will about the quality of the dialogue and the plot and whatnot, but his action scenes are always top-notch. In interviews and speaking to people who knew Santiago, they all said the same thing. He was an intelligent gentleman who was kind, loved his family, and loved making films. In 1995, he was appointed the president of the Philippines Film Development Fund to improve the quality of Filipino films and encourage production of foreign movies to be shot in the Philippines. He definitely delivered. Hey, who's your friend?